A very good evening. How are you? Robustaka. Oh. Oh. I'm very good. I am just delighted to be able to share from God's Word on God's missions around the world. And thank you so much for your kind invitation for me to come to the Philippines. I have been to Philippines before and uh, previously when I came here, it must have been more than 10 years ago. When I came to Manila and then also to Cebu City where I was teaching in the seminary in Cebu City. It is always a memorable time when I came to the Philippines because uh, you fall in love with uh, the culture, with the beautiful people, and of course, delicious food, including the balut. <laughs> and the Philippines is always uh, a wonderful place to visit, but most of all, we thank God that we are able to worship God together and irrespective of where we come from, we all worship the same God, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we thank God that we have the freedom in this place to worship God and sing the hymns of praise unto Him. But there are many places in the world today that do not have Worship just as we know of it today. And these places without the worship service is because they have never heard the good news of Jesus Christ. And therefore, wherever there is no worship, missions is therefore indispensable. We are involved in missions because there is a lack of worship. A lack of worship demands us to go forth to share the good news of Jesus Christ so that, to, so that uh, they will come to know Jesus Christ and then come to worship Him just as we are doing today. As we come up to hear our God's word of missions, let us be continually be reminded that there are places where there is no worship, missions is indispensable. We are involved in missions because there is a lack of worship. Ultimately, we want to be sure that there is a worship of the Almighty God, the creator of heavens and earth. And all people come to acknowledge Him. And tonight, I want to turn our attention to the book of Colossians. And just now we read the first uh, uh, chapter 1 verse 6. That this gospel is bearing fruit and growing just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. In the city of Colossae, in the New Testament time, when Paul wrote to the city of Colossae, it was a small town. And I'm always encouraged by the book, because this is one of the small cities that Paul wrote to and God remember. Small places. And I want to encourage your heart, you may be laboring in small places, Unknown to the world outside, but God knows you and the places that you are ministering. I grew up in a very small village long time ago in Malaysia, and I thank God that He remember people from the small places and He reached down and redeemed me to become His precious servant. The city of Colossae, or the town of Colossae, is about 100 miles east of Ephesus, where Paul ministered. Paul was ministering in Ephesus at that time, 
and uh, for three years, and uh, at the time of his ministry, uh, it was recorded in the book of Acts chapter 19, where he ministered in the Ephesus in the year 55 to 57 AD. During that time, there is a man by the name of Epaphras who came to visit, well, heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, got converted, and then most likely he is the one that returned to Colossae, where is where he was from, and established and planted the church in Colossae. If he were converted in 55, 56, A.D. and returned to Colossae after being equipped by Paul and Timothy. Then when he returned to visit Paul, when Paul was in prison in Rome during his first imprisonment, it would have been 61 or 62 A.D. By the time when he established the church in 55, 56 A.D., to the time when he returned to visit Paul again, and this time in Rome, the church in Colossae would have been about five to seven years old. It is still a very, very young church. Are you with me? It is a very young church, and therefore Paul was uh, received the news about the church in Colossae. This young church is in need of theological grounding in the Word of God and particularly a fuller understanding of the supremacy of Jesus Christ as Paul laid out for us in the first book, in the first chapter of Colossians. And then he wrote the book of Colossians back to the church in Colossae, saying therefore in one of these precious Verses in chapter so in one verse six, the thing the same way. The gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world. And during that time in Colossians chapter one or verse six, he says the gospel of Jesus Christ is bearing fruit. The gospel. The emphasis, therefore, is that there is a simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ spread. You see, the, 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 the Bible, the, the gospel is very, very simple. According to the scriptures, and Paul records for us in 1 Corinthians 15, he says that the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Christ died for us, for the sins, for the sins, and was buried, and then he rose again from the dead according to scriptures and appeared to many. The gospel of Jesus Christ is simple, that uh, you do not need a PhD to understand it. Even a little child can understand the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So as missionaries, as we go forth to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, let us not complicate what God has simplified. Sometimes I hear some scholars who teach the Bible, you make the gospel so complicated that even a nuclear scientist had a hard time understanding. But the gospel of Jesus Christ is simple. Christ died for your sins and then he rose again from the dead. He is the only one who rose again from the dead. He's the first fruits and the first born from the dead. You see, Jesus Christ died for your sins and my sins, and then he rose again from the dead. It is good news for the world today. Many are yet to hear this declaration of the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. One of our missionaries in Nepal was sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with another Nepali 
And after sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ in his very simple form, he came to know Jesus Christ and believe Christ. After he believed Christ, uh, he turned to our missionary and said, oh, oh, by the way, you told me that Christ died for my sins and he rose again from the dead. Uh, how long ago was that? And my missionary said to him, he said, about more than slightly 2,000 years ago. And he says, what? More than 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ died and rose again. And you waited until today only you come and tell me. <laughs> we can laugh about that, but it is a serious matter. Because for 2,000 years, the gospel of Jesus Christ has been spreading and yet there are people in the world today yet to hear for the first time in their life the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You do not need a lot of education to know about Jesus Christ. The deaf can even hear it and understand it. The blind can also understand it. The fat and the thin, the ugly and the beautiful, all can understand the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we have three children, and uh, when our first daughter was about three years old, one evening, she came into our room and was looking at what my wife was preparing for the children's Sunday school. And so then uh, she was curious and asked my dear wife to say, Mommy, what are you doing? And my wife took hold of that opportunity and said, I am preparing uh, the Bible study for the children. Tell us about the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. He rose again from the dead. And she shared the good news of Jesus Christ with my three-year-old daughter and then asked her, now do you want to believe Jesus Christ as your personal savior? And she said, yes, mommy. That evening, when she was three years old, she bowed her head, believed Jesus Christ as her personal savior. The simplicity of the gospel, Jesus Christ, touch of her and brought her into his glorious kingdom. And then my second daughter, when I was, uh, we were visiting our family members, our friends and relatives in Malaysia one day, uh, my second daughter came out from the room where we were staying and then waving in her hand the four spiritual laws. And she said, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy! Uh, what is this all about? I said, do you want to understand what it's all about? Come. So I sat her down on my lap and explained to her the good news of Jesus Christ. Christ died for your sins and you rose again from the dead. And then I asked her, do you want to believe Christ as your personal Savior? And she said, at that time also about three years old, yes, daddy. And she believed Jesus Christ as a personal savior since a little child. And then my youngest son, same thing too, heard the good news of Jesus Christ in the Sunday school and believed Jesus Christ at the tender age of about three or four years old. At a very young age, they can understand the good news of Jesus Christ because the gospel is a simple truth to comprehend. The grace of God dawned upon these precious souls of heaven. Grace of God hold upon the lives of even the youngest age. I love your name of the church to grace because the gospel of Jesus Christ is the grace of God given freely to all people of all ages. Grace, G-R-A-C-E, is defined as God's riches at Christ's expense. Christ died for your sins. 
and rose again from the dead. It is a simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This gospel, according to the book of Colossians chapter 1 verse 6, is spreading, growing. There is therefore the ability of the gospel throughout the whole world. In other words, there is a quantitative growth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And at that time too, Paul has always emphasized quantitative growth. Ever since the very beginning, in the founding of the church in Jerusalem, it is recorded for us in Acts chapter 2, well, first in Acts chapter 1, the Lord added to them a daily numbers daily those who were being saved. And then also in Acts chapter 6, verse 7, the church increased rapidly, a large number of them came to know Jesus Christ. And then when the church begins to move to Judea and Samaria, Acts chapter 9, verse 31, increase in numbers. And then if you were to look into the book of Acts, every missionary journey of St. Paul, and every missionary journey of St. Paul, it concludes with a statement about an increase of the churches and believers. In Acts chapter 13, 11, a great number of people were brought to the Lord. First missionary journey, it closes with these words, the word of God continued to spread and flourish. Chapter 14, verse 21, warned a large number of disciples. And in the second missionary journey, again there's the word, the churches were centered in the faith and grew daily in numbers. The third missionary journey, the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of God. And then it says, the word of God spread widely and grew in power. And then writing to the church in Colossians, this gospel is growing. Of course, at that time when Paul was saying, Growing throughout the whole world, he was referring to that part of the world where he was ministering in Asia Minor and a church grew in Jerusalem and Judea and in Asia Minor. But at this present moment, the church is growing, truly growing in all parts of the world. In fact, the church is growing the fastest at this present moment in Africa. In a year, last year, 2018, marks the first year that Africa has more Christians, about 30 million more than Latin America. Almost half of the Muslim background believers in the world today are Indonesians. You know that? Of course, Asia, where we live, has four most populous nations of the world. The most populous Islamic countries in the world are not in the Middle East, they are all in Asia. Pakistan, Bangladesh, Indonesia, and then the fourth one is what? I think I guess. Indonesia, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and the four most populous Islamic country in the world. Think again. Huh? Where? China? No. Where? Huh? Where is it? Indonesia, we stay there again. Huh? Malaysia? No. Canada? No. India. India is one of the most populous Islamic countries in the world. You know that. About 15% of the population of India besides being Hindu are Muslims. 
But almost half of the Muslim background believers in the world today are Indonesians. China has more than 100 million believers. And the church continues to grow. I was given training in China in one city. And one of the three participants told me that, you know, uh, uh, they were in charge of about uh, 2,000 home cell groups. 2,000 home cell churches. I say average how many people in one cell home group? About 50. 50 people in one cell home church multiplied by 2,000 groups. How many people would that be? Shoot, it's a lot of people. So the church is growing despite the fact that the Chinese government is trying to crush them. Even go to visit Inner Mongolia. How many of you have been in Inner Mongolia? There's a whole world out there. In the Mongolia, there are churches, thousands. There are so many churches in Inner Mongolia. Every Sunday, there are 5,000, 6,000 in one church. Amazing phenomena, given the fact that it is in a communist country. Amazing. The growth of the church, it is just amazing. I was just in Laos in the month of April. And my interpreter that we work with uh, related to me the revival of believers and Christianity in the country of Laos. And this is where the people go of Blue people, B R U, got the blue people. They speak the blue language, B R U. What happened there is that in January this year, you know, my interpreter went to this uh, village for a vacation, and while he was having vacation, about twenty to twenty-five of the blue people came to him and said. How can they come to know Jesus Christ? They want to know Him and be baptized. Now that happened when he was on vacation. They have heard about the good news from another girl who has been transformed by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And now they want to know, please tell us about Jesus Christ. And therefore during his vacation time, he baptized about 25 new believers. Then he went back again in February for his second missionary journey. And another 100 of them came to him and said, I also, we also want to know Jesus Christ. How can we know about Jesus Christ and be baptized? And at that time, he baptized another 100 people. Then in March, he went back for the third missionary journey. And another 100 came. And ask and beg him to baptize them in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so another 100 of them added to the kingdom. And then when he went back to the fourth missionary journey in April, and then a group of people came. It is hundreds and fifties of them coming to Christ at one time. And now they have about 600 people within a period of six months. My dear brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ, it is an amazing revival they have never seen anywhere in the world that has never been reported by CNN. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ is spreading throughout the whole world. It is quantitative growth. The gospel of Jesus Christ usher in quantitative growth. Now we just now say that the church was founded in Jerusalem. That's why I call a first generation church. Then the 
just fled to Antioch because there were people who, because of persecution, they were dispersed to Antioch. And the church of Antioch was founded. This has become the second generation church. Then when Paul and Barnabas were sent out from Antioch to plant the third generation church. So when Paul planted the church in Galatia, Philippi, Corinth, Thessalonica, Ephesus, it is really the third generation church. And then when Ephraim came to know Jesus Christ in Ephesus and returned to Colossae to establish the church in Colossae, it is really the fourth generation church. The church in Colossae was planted by Ephraim, not by Paul. He was trained by Paul and then he went back to plant the church in Colossae. It becomes a fourth generation church. My dear brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, that is planting the church among our rich people groups in Colossae. Now, it is our prayer and passion that eventually the church is established not only in one generation but continue to multiply to the second generation and beyond. This is what I just received in an email this year. <coughs> the church in Mexico in Nepal is started the first church. Then they sent out to plant churches in the neighboring villages, the second generation church. Another, another church again. He planted a first church, I'm no Kathmandu church. And then a second generation church in East Nepal, in, in India, and in Lalipur, the second generation. <coughs> then from here, he planted the third generation church. One generation, second generation, third generation. But I have good news for you. There are missionaries right now who planted the first church in Itahari in Nepal and then he went to the next village, get the people saved and planted the second generation church with new believers. The new believers went forth to the next village and get people saved and they become believers and they planted the third generation church and the third generation church believers went forth to the next villages and then proclaimed the good news of Jesus Christ they came to know Christ and planted the fourth generation church here's the first man planted the first generation church this person came to know Christ for him he went on to plant the second generation church. This person went to get him, share good news with him. He came to know Jesus Christ. He did another village. He planted the third generation church. This third generation Christian went to the next village. And he came to know Jesus Christ. And this person planted the fourth generation church. The fourth generation believer went to the fifth village and this person got saved and they planted the fifth generation church. But that is what we want to see. Not only one church being planted in the unreached people groups, but then the continuation and the multiplication of churches on the first generation to the second generation to the third generation the fourth generation to the fifth generation. By grace of God, we hope to see in the next number of years to the sixth and the seventh generation. Hallelujah. Amen. You see, this is God's will for us. And for the church of Jesus Christ, the church must grow 
and multiply. Just says husband and wife multiply having little children and they multiply in having churches after churches. Quantitative growth. But Paul is not only interested in just quantitative numbers. He is also interested in qualitative growth. This gospel is able to bear fruit. And the same word, bear fruit, is also used in the next verse. But here he said that we have heard. We have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all God's people. The faith and love that spring from the hopes store up for you for heaven in heaven and about which you have already heard. The gospel of Jesus Christ bears fruit in their lives. The church was grounded. But then the gospel of Jesus Christ produced fruit because they have faith in Jesus Christ and the love for all God's people. And then he says again too, in verse 9 to 14, he says that you, Paul was praying so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work. The same word is used. Bearing fruits. In verse 6, he refers to quantitative growth. But Paul prayed that you will continue to bear fruit in every good work that is quantitative growth. When we are in missions, our desire, of course, is to plant the church among the rich. But after having planted a church among our rich, we need to disciple them and root them in the word of God so that the gospel will produce fruits in their lives. Tell that there is qualitative growth. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 6, he says uh, that the gospel is very fruit and growing throughout the whole world. Then at the end of Colossians, Paul says, we proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. His ultimate goal is not only the planting of the church, but disciple making of those believers so that they will be presented perfect in Jesus Christ. It is both quantitative and qualitative growth that Paul was about. The ability of the gospel of Jesus Christ to spread and to produce fruit in the Christian life. The Sarah like say he's, he's the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. In order to do that, of course, this morning I talk about the design of the curriculum, the at least 10 basic books for them to study and to understand the Word of God much more effectively. Our organization also produced a monthly magazine called Side by Side, Side by Side, walking with the pastors and the church planters side by side. Every month it is being sent out to the missionaries and pastors. And most of them will use this to preach and to also do Bible study. And so if you are interested, just let me know. Of course, there are also other books we produce so that they are being discipled in the Word of God. Such as this year, we just finished a book called The Journey of Discipleship. And then the other books called Missions, Reaching the Rich and Planting Churches. From Darkness to Light, our testimonies of God's transforming power in the lives of believers. Dreams and Visions 
the Kriplinger, the book of Daniel. I use the word decrypting in the book of Daniel because you say that you know computers, you know got encryption and decryption. Nothing new. God did it with the dream to Nebuchadnezzar. He encrypted it. Daniel decrypted. Are you with me? Yeah. Just decrypting the book of Daniel. Just publish the finale. Messages from the book of Revelation. Of course, there are also other books available in order to produce fruit in a Christian life. The simplicity of the gospel. The gospel is simple. The gospel is able. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world throughout the whole world in other words there is the universality of the gospel throughout the whole world irrespective of the nations and cultures it is for worldwide distribution it is for the Chinese as well as the Portuguese it's for the Filipinos as well as the Africans. It's for the Middle Easterners as well as for Europeans. It's for the Americans as well as the Americans. It's for the fat as well as for the thin. The corn and the thread is for the short. It is universal appeal of the gospel. Therefore, we cannot accuse God of discrimination. The gospel never discriminates. I'm so glad that God gave the gospel as universal, as universal appeal. You know, I, I would be so troubled if, uh, you know, I love to eat also Korean kimchi. It would be terrible if God was to ask us to eat kimchi because the Americans would not like kimchi. It does not have a universality as a gospel. You know, you love Balut here. You know, I'm glad that God never, yeah, never I make uh, Balut a universal food, even though it tastes good. <laughs> or in Japan, you know, they eat sushi. Uh, but I'm glad that he never made sushi a universal for everybody. But he made a gospel universal. There is a universality of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, if you look at the world today, in this circle, there are more people living inside this circle than outside this circle. And here are the, um, the frontier people groups. Those are the people groups that are yet to be reached. Many of them are Muslims, Hindus, and Buddhists. Buddhism. Most of these people, they are the 31 largest frontier people groups that comprise about total population of 881 million, 11.5% of the world population are scattered in this area. Most and the largest and rich people groups are located in this area. 31 largest. Oh, sorry. And Therefore, there is the task of evangelism and missions lie before us. There is therefore the universality of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And tonight, at the beginning of this missions conference, we want to specially pray for several items. And afterwards, I want you to gather the groups together to pray for these things. First of all, I want you to pray for the harvest. 
first of all, the harvest falls. The Bible says to us, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask therefore the Lord of the harvest, therefore to send our workers into his own harvest field. These are the If you take the world and design in such a way as to where most missionaries are needed, the world will look like this. In Asia, Central, Asia, South Asia, including India, this is the area where the most needing missionaries. And I'm glad the Grace Missions is sending missionaries to this part of the world that is most needful of frontier workers. Those are the areas here, many of you, including Filipinos, Chinese, Korean, India, Nigeria, Latin America, are rising up to the challenge of bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to the unreached. How many missionaries work among the unreached people groups? Only about one in ten that works among the unreached. We still need more workers to be sent to the unreached people who have never heard the good news of Jesus Christ, not even once. So we need to pray that God will send more workers into his harvest field. I would suggest that the church put out the big map of the world in front of the church. And then put a mirror beside the map and put down below the mirror future missionary. And then you stand before the mirror as you come into the church and say to her, Pray to God, God, send more workers. I tell you, God is going to call more workers from among you. That's what happened to me. When I was in college, after seeing the needs of the vision field, I said, God, send more workers. Send more workers. And God turned around and said to me, I'm sending you. And not me, Lord, not me. I say, send more workers. And yeah, yeah, yeah. You say, send more workers. You didn't say, exclude me. I'm sending you. So I became answer to my own prayer. It's a very dangerous prayer. So will you please pray? Send more workers. All right? You don't want to pray? No. If you don't want to pray, you are disobeying God's command. <laughs> because God said, pray. Then the Lord of Harvest will send our workers. It's a command. And so, either way you are caught. <laughs> are you with me? Either way you are caught. So you better pray for workers. And then when God answers, uh, I'm sending you. You become the answer to your prayer. And I hope that the church will, you know, put up not only the pictures of missionaries, but the mirror, send and then put below the mirror, future missionary. And uh, make it a requirement before you come into the church, you must pray first. <laughs> and see that God is going to send more missionaries of this church to the other world's end of the earth. That will be wonderful to see that. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Next one I want you to pray afterwards is the harvest field. Open your eyes. Look at the fields. They are ripe right for harvest. This is India. In India, frontier people groups 1,942. 76% so of India's 2,565 people groups are the frontier most unreached. 
are all here. India represents one of the most crucial continents to reach. One in five of all people on earth live in India. If you have five members in your family, one of them ought to be in India. Half of the population of all country groups live in India. Seven of ten people in India live in frontier people groups. Most of them are completely unrich. Five out of six of the remaining 7,000 unrich people groups live in restricted access countries. What percentage of the world's Hindus, Muslims, and Buddhists do not know a Christ follower? 81% do not know, have never heard the good news of Jesus Christ. I want you to pray too for the harvest fruits. Or in first in Colossians chapter 1. Chase, we pray for you. Because you have come to know Jesus Christ. We have not stopped praying for you. And God asks us therefore at the beginning of this conference to devote ourselves first of all to the prayer of the harvest force. Harvest field and a harvest fruits. And I want uh, you, all of us, to uh, stand together. And I want you to get into groups of two or three, asking God, first of all, to send more workers into the harvest field and pray for God to prepare the harvest field that will be receptive to the gospel of Jesus Christ and God will preserve the fruits of the harvest that you and I to be faithful to the task of global missions. So will you please rise and gather yourselves about two or three or four of you in one group and then pray for the next number of minutes. I've been to Korea and Korean churches love to pray together. And then uh, you can uh, turn around and uh, uh, two or three of you uh, turn around and pray. Okay? Alright, let's devote the next 15 minutes in prayer.
Oh God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time together that we can learn from the scripture about your own passion and the love for the world that people will come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. We pray, oh God, that you will send forth more laborers from this church into the mission of hell. We raise up workers for you. We also pray, O oh God, that you will prepare the mission field to be receptive to the Word of God so that the Gospel will grow and spread and bear fruit, both quantitatively and qualitatively. We pray, O oh God, that you continue to watch over us, preserve our hearts, keep us faithful unto you until we see Jesus Christ face to face. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Thank you.